going to uh, start this talk actually um, with a um, video, and um, my links kind of got broken so, um, in the tr in the transfer. So just bear with me for a second. Um, sound is not needed. This is a structural film by Ken Jacobs. So um, I'm going to do the first part of this talk. Um, um, I'm going to be reading um, some more dense pieces, and then I'm going to um, go into a little bit more of an off-the-cuff discussion mode um, with some slides that relate to a media arts network that I research that's transnational between um, New York State and Canada. Um, but right now, um, I want to talk about the poetics of obsolescence, and I want to talk about this in reverse. So this talk springs from the notion that we can learn from the structural media histories of moments of hybrid media ontology. Ontology put simply as ways of being, in which emergent media arts inherently formed as inter, um, as developing hybridly from previous structures and practices of known media epistemologies. This notion of predictive media archaeology comes from Juicy Perica, but not without some interdisciplinary criticism. Uh, for in his book, The Introduction um, to What is Media Archaeology, he repeats a perspective on the genealogy of media archaeology in new film history um, that is championed by Thomas Elsayer, um, that um, the discovery of early cinema occurred in the mid-70s, and its most notable event for media archaeologists occurred in 1978. In his perspective on the relevance of media archaeology informing new film history and new film history informing digital, digital culture research, uh, El Sayeser uh, considers archivists, film historians, and film scholars, but he leaves out the makers. Um, one of the makers you're looking at is showing right now on the screen. Ken Jacobs' experimental film, Tom Tom, The Piper's Son, a landmark 1969 screening of a structural re edit of a 1905 early silent film, predates this historical timeline, reminding us that disciplinary method and genealogies of epistemology share a space of intellectual development that can isolate whole networks, and very important ones at that. Um, uh, this so happens to be um, a transnational New York State Emergent Media Arts Network um, that I study um, from uh, b basically 1968 to the current moment, okay? Just as John Berger, um, the uh, cultural and um, media critic, um, in his book about looking, insisted that photographs needed to be recirculated in new structures of social memory, making... Um, in, in, in order to, and I don't mean social memory, I mean social memory making, um, active making to resist the ossifications of historical narrative acquisition and also commodity. This is an example of makers re-territorializing new film history before the historians' conferences and their books did. Mine will be an epistemological modification of El Sayeser's insistence on the poetics of obsolescence that media archaeology um, should read media, media history against the grain, provide friction, uncover layers, probe strata, and dig out neglected histories. Mine is a cultural history that is meant to inform maker practices of epistemological hybridity. Uh, Fred Camper called this film, um, uh, Ken Jacobs' Tom Tom, a film about watching movies. That's what he called it. Um, I think it's a film about media watching divorced from making. Um, so you can see what he's doing um, with, the with the structure of the film here. Structural film itself was a time-based, backward-looking, and forward-thinking kind of media archaeology that embraced old media, the alternative space movement for artist-led institutions, or what we should really call counter-institutions, um, and this art revolutions of the 1960s and 1970s. Um, these converged um, in structural film as well as fragmented off, producing practices of emergent video, signal processing, and electronic and digital media. 
Its making and experience reminds us of the social encounter of individual perception and the physical nature of media, and in between the tempor temporal spatial veracity at question between both of them. I will be revisiting structural film as a locational node in an artist network of working class avant-garde counter-institutional developments to structurally support experimental and, em and emergent media arts. These inform some de- and re-territorializing aspects of early net art. Now I, sorry, it's, it, it might take me a while to switch in between things, so. Bear with me here. Oh good, I'm glad it didn't do that again. Okay. I'm uh, showing you some films by Tony Conrad. We might then apply these lessons to our current hybrid moment of late capitalist crisis, a moment demanding creative action between the data body and the social body. I will not say that this creative action should be political in the rigid sense that we often understand it. Um, this is especially true for me being an American coming from a country with two political parties. So you've seen what that kind of uptake structure has done. Um, where was I? Um, what more thinking about is um, micropolitical action, uh, both virtual and locational, embracing specific context and the projections of possibility onto those structures to evoke not just change but inclusive justice. This epistemological hybridity of ways of knowing the state of things can produce friction in an aging system, a geriatric endless growth illusion on a dying planet that much like the mainstream art institutions and its absorption of globalized process and experimental art antecedents, makes specific struggles and contexts in this universalized system of media art often invisible. So in his book, uh, In the Flow, it's, it's Boris Groys' um, most recent book, um, he asks us to revisit the network universalism of the art movement of formalism. This is the formalist art movement that was championed by um, Clement Greenberg. Um, looking past this kind of apolitical, spiritual, market-driven art uh, to how it shows that the avant-garde at this post-war point in time and Western space detached from the bourgeoisie and aligns means of productions economically with mass culture. As structural film artist Tony Conrad explained, however, Depersonalized spectacle has induced a sense in viewers everywhere that media images arise as an infinite distance in space and power from them, from the image reception site, a site which often lies within the most intimate recesses of their domestic life. Even if this alignment risks the technocratic appropriation passivity and atrophied consciousness of mass culture's fatal consumption, that's according to Adorno, or since then, the postmodern, technologically repackaged cultural reincarnations of capitalism, identified by Frederick Jameson, um, that's his nostalgia mode, and uh, Mark Fisher saw this in the, the transition from uh, TV westerns to uh, Star Wars. Uh, we might consider suggests Boris Groys, what this avant-garde realignment of the post-war period means structurally. It suggests that we might reconsider alternative pot potentialities of this re relational realignment of class bodies between mass culture and the avant-garde. Avant-pop, which Larry McCaffrey in the 90s identified as cultural production in harmony with capitalism, can also arguably be an uptake system for counter-appropriation. My question here is, how might, we, how might we reappropriate this hybrid cultural data body for redirection to the social body? I have two reasons for this question. The first, as media artist and scholar Hito Sterl 
explains in her book, Duty Free Art, are in the age of planetary civil war. She's getting right to the point here. Um, art has become an often stateless and untaxed proxy for neoliberal capital and violent inequality. Assisted by a list of the platforms that were supposed to be what Hakim Bey called temporary autonomous zones, were supposed to be the carnivalesque. These include, and this is according to Hito Sterl, the internet, biennials, art fairs, and parallel pop-up histories. So the current avant pop pop-up gentrifies and fails to see local territorial investment. For example, a David Lynch-themed local pop-up gallery I attended, um, David Lynch-themed artwork by multiple artists, um, was co-sponsored by the David Lynch Foundation. It took place in an abandoned apartment store in a blighted, residentially homogenous community of color that is already territorial predated upon by other demographically white corporate festivals. I'm talking about um, where I live in the city of Buffalo. Um, these mass culture uptakes of the avant-garde are localizing wide gentrification patterns. And I'm showing you something um, in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, okay. Um, they do not seed local business and in the meanwhile contribute to things like public urination on black people's property and the visibility of unfair standards of public criminalization. I've seen this regularly. And I think we need to think more about how to reverse this flow of deterritorialized mass culture into avant-garde alternative economies that regardless of um, struggle to territorial, or territorialize local experimental artist networks as residential laboratories. I'll talk about how important this is. Um, this is because uh, they fail, and I'm talking about things like pop-ups, they fail to counter the gentrification and dismantling of welfare state support structures and low-cost housing that Mark Fisher, in his Ghosts of My Life, identified as necessary to the incubation of market-indifferent, experimental, emergent, and alternative cultural production in the late 20th century. Um, I will note that many of the artists that Mark Fisher um, analyzes and talks about um, tend to be white and male, so that's important to, to point out. Take, for example, how um, Staina Vasulka, co-founder of the Experimental Intermedia Art Center, The Kitchen, uh, describes the local growth of experimental art culture in the 70s in mixed interactional spaces of nonprofits and affordable housing. It was a true village. We were all in walking distance to each other. In fact, Vasulka notes, electronic musicians and dancers easily floated in to fill slots at the kitchen in between films, and Nam June Pike used to come down the street to screenings in his slippers and blankets because he lived somewhere down the block. Um, this local density was instrumental when sharing expensive emergent media equipment and forming new shared knowledge, practices, and vocabulary. Here's another quote. That was the times, it was everywhere. Everybody was sharing and everybody was always sending you to meet someone you ought to meet because they could help you. New York was a very friendly place in those years. And the idea of sharing and pooling and using instruments and hooking them together, it was completely spontaneous. It, meaning video art, um, and also signal processing of video, wasn't yet a medium. It wasn't acknowledged. No writer had any vocabulary. The journalists were scared of it more than anything else. So that's, the community did that, okay? In, in close relational spaces that became laboratories. Here's my second reason. Privatize, and this is about the, the question of avant pop and the counter institution. Privatization and its dismantling of public funding has threatened experimental artist-led counter-institutional spaces and their ethos of funding artistic process regardless of product. The Kitchen, for example, whose influential trajectory included video art, e-music, and signal processing art was founded using public money from the New York State Council of the Arts. NISCA predated and served as a model for the NEA, an organization which is now regularly in the news under threat of defunding. Um, and I'm also going to note that um, 
uh, was at Harper's Bazaar um, probably two weeks ago, put out an article saying that New York City was now a gated community um, because of the, the level of gentrification going on there. Um, so we're talking about the loss of territorial um, social body uh, laboratory spaces. Um, so NISCA encouraged artist collectives uh, and later NEA funding, public funding, encouraged artist collectives to form registered nonprofits. NISCA also encouraged artists to form nonprofits outside of New York City, sending them throughout the state and networked up towards the nation's northern border with Canada, like experimental public media programs diffusing like spores. Here's a little diagram of spore. If you've looked at um, diagrams of decentralization, um, it might look a little bit familiar, um, but I'm also going to um, talk a little bit about um, spherical thinking um, and, and, and the kind of protective envelopes that just decentralization needs. Okay. Um, and there's something I, I, di I didn't put in here, but I want to talk about really quickly, which is in Buffalo, um, we had in, uh, an Amazon bid that failed. And I brought this up um, at the um, logging out uh, conference that happened at University of Toronto a couple months ago, um, is that when you, when you have a mid-sized city that doesn't have the kind of protections against gentrification structures like Airbnb, um, like you have in cities like San Francisco, um, what you have in a city the size of Buffalo, or even if you have neighborhoods um, that are, are decentralized, blighted, whatever, and they don't change for long periods of time, we have to realize that when those cities create the boilerplates for those big multinational tech company bids, those boilerplates don't change for years, okay? A lot of the, um, the housing policy and all these things are behind on it. And, and this is what I brought up at this conference because um, this is, what, what the boilerplate is, is basically a data body that has been created from a social body and that data body is not gonna change unless we find ways to, t to territorialize change and change that social body, change that boilerplate, change that bid, that bid in Buffalo failed, but it's already been, the, there's, the city is already using basically the same thing to bid for another ma multinational site. It's that quick. Um, so that's something to think about. The spore diagram. <laughs> um, in addition to networking locally, nationally, and transnationally with other emergent media counter institutions, Many networked, artist-run counter-institutions formed or were founded through alliances with faculty, departments, and centers in American educational institutions. I don't know uh, much about this as I should with Canada. Um, my research is starting to move into Ontario and um, also the public access move movement in Ontario, which is, was one of the strongest in North America, along with, um, with uh, New York City, centered in Soho. Um, and uh, I will get into some um, Canadian alliances when I start getting into um, Avalanche magazine. I, I won't get to that yet. But um, so these artist-run counter institutions formed or were fo founded through alliances with faculty departments and centers in American educational institutions. These affiliated positions formed what I call counter institutional pockets. They could utilize the resources and sometimes political protections of major institutions and direct them to the support of experimental and process-based arts and counter-institutional nonprofit models. So what I'm talking about here um, is an envelope of an artist-led, peer-curated counter-institution that doesn't have to produce market-driven or product-based stuff. Um, in fact, um, there is a, an oral history of the kitchen, oh no, I'm sorry, it was the Experimental Ten Television Center, which came out of um, the State University of New York at Binghamton, um, that when NISCA first started um, requiring um, evidence of art, um, video art that participants in the, in the artist residencies had done, they just refused to provide it until NISCA kind of learned that um, if they were going to have a public media program, then they had to go along with process-based art 
our, and, and the funding wouldn't be pulled. So um, if you know Ed Sanders, um, who was a media activist, um, primarily in the late 60s, he was in the Yippies, he was part of the ceremony to levitate the Pentagon. Um, he did a lot of like, you know, public art, media shamanism kind of stuff. Um, he, I, I did an interview with him that is coming out this month in the LA Review of Books. And um, he talked about the happening. And we're going to talk about the happening. And he, he talks about the, how the happening was utilized for politically disruptive and alternative um, economic means. A lot of it was based around absurdist theater kind of practices and intermedia that would include music and painting a cow and just, you know, things like that. Um, some happenings would um, use a military helicopter to drop a piano or something. Um, but they were also used to generate alternative economies um, for people attending them. But also, I have to bring up, what would Alan Caprow's happening model be without Rutgers University? Uh, perhaps more importantly uh, to the transnational New York network I study, some of the first uh, cinema and then media arts university programs in the country were founded in public universities. So structural filmmaker Ken Jacobs, who according to Michelle Pearson, modeled his millenn Millennium Film Workshop on the working class avant-garde model of the progressive era free school and the lending library, this was a media arts equipment lending library, um, Ken Jacobs went on to teach in the first cine depart cinema department in the State University of New York system. Michael Denning identified this kind of working class avant-garde and intellectual alliance in the free schools and membership organizations of the culture front of progressive era pro-worker social movements, including um, free school and membership organizations for ethnically excluded uh, unions, but also very much aligned with the avant-garde. You're talking about like Langston Hughes's suitcase theater, you're talking about um, Woody Guthrie and people's artists. Um, and we can see this model in 1960s membership-based film community organizations founded in New York by filmmakers like Ken Jacobs and Jonas Makas. And of course, these are the types of people who are, are following that, the, that, those convergences and divergences that I was talking about, structural film, video signal processing, um, programmed art, kinetic art, um, all kinds of emergent media practices. Um, a lot of them from this protected position, or let's say stable position in the university. Um, according to Pearson, the development of film programs at universities provided filmmakers like Jacobs with secure employment for the first time and an expanded network of, uh, course, media arts was soon to follow. The first media arts program to ever be established at a university was founded at the state university, and I, and I mean the first media arts program to be established at a university ever was um, at my home institution, the State University of New York at Buffalo. Using NISCA money, in 1972. Um, here I'm citing um, Lenka Dolanova. Structural filmmakers and signal processing video artists, including Stena and Woody Vasulka of The Kitchen, were some of the first faculty there at Buffalo. As such, 20th century support structures for conceptual and process art, emergent and experimental media, and a working class avant-garde have eroded under neoliberal economics and cultural logics. I believe it is up to the avant-garde to support its own spatial and cultural revitalization while simultaneously mobilizing resources in popular public opinion. Um, I'm talking about mass cultural parasitization um, to the re-territorialization of spaces and resources for experimental and political unhindered cultural production. Um, if you have to, um, go, go with, the, with the mass culture alignment. Um, towards this goal of suffusing cultural networks with social justice, the rest of this talk will be both historically and theoret theoretically tactical and modular in presentation. You can re-territorialize what you will with this. I'm going to switch a little. In the Poetics of Space, Gaston Bachelard, and please pardon my pronunciation because I'm horrifically working class, um, identifies the space of both painful isolation and pleasurable reflection, suffering, and creative imagination as that of the garret. 
His conception of man in the garret conveys a universalized male head of household. He knows instinctively, writes Bachelard, that this space identified with his solitude is creative, that even when it is forever expunged from the present, when henceforth it is alien to all the promises of the future, even when we no longer have a garret, when the attic room is lost and gone, there remains the fact that we once loved a garret, once lived in an attic. We return to them in our dreams. These retreats have the value of a shell. Notably, the house of Bachelard's garret implies certain forgotten layers of supporting strata, um, much like we see in larger spherical scales. I would like to territorialize some historical epistemological friction in this abstract modernist conception of white male subject rather than receiver. Um, this is a concept of modernist subjecthood recycled thus far, according to John Berger, back into the postmodern. This re-territorialization will question how we should place our creative conceptions of human regermination away from the DIY and back into the network. The global north resisting a turn to fascism as middle class whiteness becomes no longer immune to the necropolitical racialized capitalisms it used to be immune from will require different kinds of epistemology as well. You came here for net art, right? We are, after all, finding ourselves now within the post-digital condition, where the techno-utopic and cyber-libertarian imaginary of internet and open platform has turned to see the inevitably entangled physical state of its powerful and server bodies. Our effective situation of this realization that the exploitatively physical and relational shapes the digital and vice versa is perhaps summed up by Miriam Rausch of Amsterdam University's Institute of Network Cultures. Um, in her shadow book publication on digital social relation, relation, she writes, I guess we are kind of in an old relationship with the internet now and might need therapy. So what if the digital will be forever relational to our physical lives? What if there is no separating? And there's not. At Documenta 11, the Tsunami Net Collective highlighted this inseparability. Their 2002 net art project, Alpha 3.4, broadcasted a live feed of their trek from the Documenta 11 exhibition site to the site of its server infrastructure. This was the infrastructure missing when Alan Koprow, in his 1966 book, Assemblages, Environments, and Happenings, envisioned the global, participatory, active, and totally experiential future of the happening. Caprow writes, the performance of a happening should take place over several widely spaced, sometimes moving and changing locales. A single performance space tends toward the static and more significantly resembles conventional theater practice. He continues, it is presently advantageous to experiment by, by gradually widening the distances between events within a happening. First along several points on a heavily trafficked avenue, then in several rooms and floors of an apartment house where some activities are out of touch with each other, then on more than one street, then in different but proximate cities, finally all around the, gl the globe. This brings us to the analog art of the network, the long distance telephone event, mail art, the broadcast television live feed, and you're seeing some net art that's actually intermediate with some of these things. Um, Namjoon Pike's Good Morning, Mr. Orwell. These would align with media arts that Tony Conrad said focused on the picture plane of sea space, works with, which either increase interactivity and direct community building, or as he puts it, at least reify the distance between maker and viewer as the space of community, his emphasis on community. So um, amongst the sea space, he includes public access television uh, and video, which um, has also been um, significantly uh, deregulated. That's why it's gone. When Ricardo Dominguez of the Critical Art Ensemble moved to New York City from Tallahassee, Florida, the artist collective had already theorized what he called the performative matrix of data bodies and real bodies. He had never used a computer in his life. Um, and uh, he had also theorized, I'm sorry, the, the Critical Art Ensemble had also 
theorize the ability to electronically enact direct action civil um, disobedience in the new streams of e-commerce. Dominguez was looking for the infrastructure to work with this. The network he formed in New York became both physical and virtual, jamming servers with email for the digital Zapatistas movement in Mexico, managing a bulletin board system and hosting service for artists called The Thing, um, thething.net. Um, he also collaborated to create an auto-ethnographic um, work of um, e-literature from email exchanges with Australian artist Francesca de la Rimini, of the VNS, VNS Matrix Cyber Feminist Collective, um, which is what you're seeing here. Um, as Dominguez described it, I started working with her while she was swimming in a pool in Japan and I was at a party in New York. The dense artist network space of New York provided for access to computers, local exhibitions, and hybrid networks. One show called Teleport Diner germinated from an exchange at a local diner. Dominguez and fellow artist diners were asked to be picked up from the diner and flown to sit in a recreation of the diner in Stockholm, Sweden, over a period of 24 hours. However, Teleport Diner's irony is that it was facilitated by the same global space shrinking technologies that have since chipped away at artist neighborhoods in New York City. Um, and this has changed very much from when Jonas Makis said he arrived in New York City um, in the post-war period, and he had always wanted to be an artist and a filmmaker and a poet, and he could finally um, meet the networks and the cheap equipment to do so. The infrastructure for achieving Teleport Diner was efficient, but um, Dominguez recalled getting sun madness from too much daylight and getting sick. So again, we have these kind of, uh, this kind of friction against the idealization of what um, what bodies can do as they approach data bodies. And, uh, and again, I'm talking about this, this intermediate continuum from, um, from the internet um, that started in electronic communications um, and uh, that, uh, that facilitated globalization um, and, and then what this is actually doing to our social body. You cannot have a data body without a social body. So I've been um, in for 30 minutes. I know we started late, and I know that we have a, like a workshop session set up after this. If you um, need to leave, um, please feel free. I'm just going to continue unless someone else has a better idea. I'm open to it. Thumbs up? OK. I have to do this thing where I toggle, and I get disoriented um, because of my broken links. In Catherine McKittrick's essay on black women's geographies, the concept of the garret is reconceptualized to consider the escaped slave narrative of Harriet Jacobs, who survived her two-year ordeal of escape in the tiny garret in incredible pain, permanently cramped, drilling holes in the wooden walls to look down on her children outside, cognizant of her network allowing her to make choices between, between self confinement and social confinement. Strategy and critique, explains McKittrick, relates to how the realm of freedom is conceptualized by those who have never been free. Citing Jacob's slavery narrative, McKittrick conceives of the Garrett as a, quote, loophole of retreat for possibilities in the existing landscape. Okay, the, in this existing landscape is slavery. Um, with a different sense of place, based in her oppressed and marginalized experience. At a post-digital time when none of us who must work um, can entirely be free of the digital, in the words of Bowie, can drop our cell phone down below, how can we take on and re-territorialize this epistemological and cultural othering of what would be Foucault's intellectual genealogy? In, in this intellectual gene genealogy, it travels networks, it doesn't travel continuous time, doesn't travel continuous space, okay? Um, and uh, othering this intellectual genealogy in our media arts and activist thinking. How can we take on the performative automaton notion of doubling oneself 
that Hal Foster borrows from Dada artist M Emmy Hennings and turn that scripted relational life to agency. Derrida's Einstein of oneness into plurality or Audre Lorde's uh, po politics um, of um, poetic difference um, are not only a universalist refusal but a generative projection of difference. Did this play at all? Okay. Hi. Okay, so I, I wanted to show you um, this transporter, this, this, this transporter um, immigrant tool that was also um, made by Roberto Dominguez um, uh, brings uh, people who are doing illegal border crossings, illegal, right, border crossings, um, both uh, access to maps to water caches that will save their life and poetry to sustain them on their journey. Um, it's, a, it's a mobile phone app. Um, it, and it, it will come up later. Okay, so um, I am briefly going to talk about um, the net art piece by Mendy and Keith Obadike called Blackness for Sale. Um, and I know you came here for net art. Please forgive me as a media cultural historian of the long 20th century, but I'm explaining a current crisis whose alternative future requires some media archeological foresight to how some of us got into this mess where others have been placed and the myopia of past privilege and passive language. And um, uh, another thing I'm, I'm really trying to get at is that um, uh, as much as critical art ensemble is talking about how they theorized data bodies before they had the access, um, we can find this way back um, into history. In incidents in the life of a slave girl, Harriet Jacobs' mul multiplicity of planning and achieving her escape and that of her children from within the garret gives her a conception of an agentive data body. She occupies space that, according to Jillian Rose, would be mutually exclusive if charted on a two-dimensional map, but are simultaneously, oh, I'm sorry, but are occupied simultaneously. Think if we plotted the points of that collective action, agency and networking from her confinement in a single garret. Um, that's that's the, the, the multiple paths on the map. Um, we can also see this doubleness in the performances of black ethnological spectacles that gave rise not only to limited agency, but opportunities for locational friction. So I showed you that Edison film of the Eskimo village, right? It's like ridiculous how he set that up. Um, so that's what I'm talking about, um, limited agency, but opportunities for locational friction, where white audiences, such as those at the 1901 Pan American Exposition, could be upset by the business acumen and geopolitical savvy of people from the newly acquired Philippines in their ethnological um, showcase or the technological adaptation of identified Native Americans um, in the Indian Congress that came out in moments of locational discourse. Um, these are just various narratives you'll find at the, at the, from, from that history. Um, even if those performers otherwise had a script to follow. Um, and uh, and it, I think these performativities are, become more visible than, than many of our own, um, but they're still there. Yuri McMillian um, might call them embodied avatars, a purposeful self-objectification. Re-territorializations make broken social relations visible. We might compare this to Mendy and Keith Obadike's 2001 net art um, project, Blackness for Sale. Uh, net art anthology called it a tongue-in-cheek intervention into the budding system of e-commerce on the consumer uh, internet. In this piece, Keith's blackness would, was put up for sale on eBay um, to highlight its dematerialized appropriation through structurally visible internet monetization. The form required eBay seller's location um, was listed as cultural landscape. In this globalized market, however, blackness for sale noted in the product description that Mr. Obadike's blackness has been used primarily in the United States 
and its functionality outside the United States cannot be guaranteed. I've included this random comment on this piece by my colleague, oh no, I'm sorry, we don't have the slide, but um, my colleague Mac, M um, Mark Garrett, um, he's, he's um, my, my virtual colleague, he's um, in part of Further Field Gallery, um, the co-founder in London. Um, it was funny because when I was revisiting this net art piece on the net art anthology on the Rhizome website, I found his data body. <laughs> He had made some comments, some very disparaging comments about the, the monopoly of rhizome on net art. <laughs> and so um, I had asked him if I could show this uh, in my slides, and he was like, yeah, sure. Um, but um, unfortunately, that slide is not there. Um, uh, you, we can also compare this to when, um, and this is in 2016, very recently, Link New York City removed internet browsing kiosks from across New York City. Um, because of a widespread outcry over people using it to watch porn. Um, this may have re-territorialized the widespread and apparently more acceptable de-territorialized daily sexualizations and street harassment of women that was already blurring the public-private divide in New York City a bit too much for comfort. So they tore the internet kiosks out. Um, and in the sense, that is also something tactical to think of and get less. <laughs> amusement. It's something tactical to think about too, how if you just take something that is social relational and you re-territorialize it, you can make people really uncomfortable about, uncomfortable about things that they um, are, are otherwise able to ignore in terms of social justice. Um, so this brings us to time-space issues of public media art and maker epistemology, subjectivity from within and beyond our own personal experience and supporting the othered in their territorial um, resilience. And now I'm on the slide I'm supposed to be on. Does anyone have any questions so far? Because I'll just keep going. <laughs> okay. So um, this is, this is a, a broken um, anti-globalization movement alt press link from the, um, the early 2000s. In his theory of performative matrix between the data body and the real body, Ricardo Dominguez also discusses the performative matrix between artists and theory and artists and institutions. For example, when the FBI came to investigate the poetic water cash app he built for illegal border crossers with electronic disturbance theater, they were thwarted when he said that Walter Benjamin um, was the one who was one of the people that they knew had used this app. Now, Walter Benjamin committed suicide at the Nazi border because he couldn't get out. Um, so this is how a performative matrix of knowing art theory um, protected that artist collective when dealing with the FBI. They just took the name Walter Benjamin down and left them alone. Um, uh, and, and Dominguez described how in spirit when he had made this app, he had thought about Walter Benjamin. Um, now when Dominguez was questioned on who was hosting a, a particular virtual sit-in, um, this is from a Rhizome interview and I don't know if the virtual sit-in was one of the ones that he did for the Zapatistas movement. Um, but when he was questioned on who was, who is hosting this virtual sit-in, he told them MIT or Rhizome, okay, um, is it, a way to thwart the investigation. Um, but there could also be an overinvestment in the data body. And this slide is an example of that overinvestment in the data body. Um, as Jeffrey Juris points out in his research on new digital media in the anti-globalization movement, especially as the movement spread to all kinds of global cities following the, the um, WTO pro protests in Seattle, which were very successful and they were trying to keep it going. Um, Juris describes the digital art alternative press as it moved to spread information and organize actions from what he calls temporary media hubs and also forums like Indie Media. Indie Media, sorry. Police would target these media centers and smash them, attacking activist journalists. Today, the online archives of the alt media of the anti-globalization movement and its narratives are riddled 
much like er early um, elit or electronic literature works and net art works, with a found poetry of broken links. Um, this loss points to the limitations of Juris's digitally created radical social movement publics and brings us back to the dilemma of brick and mortar archives, okay? Um, not only um, brick and mortar archives that are, um, that are resilient, but also can still afford the same types of protections from surveillance. Um, Miriam Rausch, in her essay on um, the post-digital condition, um, refers to this as a resistance to digitalization. Now, depending on what discipline you're coming from, and I talked about the epistemological limits of discipline, um, vocabulary gets left out. Um, so sometimes I interact with the digital humanities um, kind of sphere and um, have encountered l multiple insistences that um, digitalization is not a term. Um, that when people say digitalization, they mean digitization. When people take physical objects like archives and they digitize them, they put them online. But in um, the post-digital condition, what Miriam Rausch is talking about is she's talking about how communities have to resist uh, digi their, the ability to be digitized, um, sometimes at the same time. So this is, a, this is a dilemma, again, another tactical dilemma to consider um, is that, um, s and you see this uh, with community organizing on Twitter where, um, where communities and epistemologies are immediately attacked and trolled be before they can form anything, right? They get broken apart by trolling because they're too visible um, in the digital and they're vulnerable. Um, so this is something to think about as well. Uh, this brings us to the territory um, from the data body um, to the territory of the social body in performative matrix. So in his book um, called The Uprising on Poetry and Finance, Bifo Berardi recounts the failure of the Occupy movement, which sprung up semi-digitally around the world in 2011 to spread its critique of 1% economics and increasing social inequality. He locates this failure in an ability to connect with the social body. How, asks Berardi, can we think a process of subjectivation, which he uses all kinds of, you know, wacky language from an outsider, but I'm, I'm hoping we can start to dance around what he might mean when he says, how can we think a process of subjectivation where precarity is jeopardizing social solidarity and when the social body is wired by techno-linguistic automatisms. Think uh, success anxiety, for example, um, which reduce its activity to a repetition of embedded patterns be of behavior. And so the data body um, is sometimes creating these repetitive um, patterns of behavior in the social body. Increasingly, pro-globalization uh, anti-internationalism is being implemented to think that it is more local. Um, and of course here we have um, this standoff between Nazis and um, probably traditional anarchists, um, which might drive the point home. Um, uh, I'll say it again, pro-globalization, anti-internationalism, um, even if that pro-globalization uh, is, is passive, um, being implemented to think that it is more local, to defensively self-sustain the internal fabric of nationhood against its modular economic dismantling through embattled fascisms, these themselves residual of the post-New Left reactionary culture wars. Tarek McPherson has pointed out how this fascist streak can deterritorialize and recruit through the digital, from white cultural heritage web pages to Reddit, um, she doesn't cover Reddit, um, um, to networked MM RP games. Um, so uh, we see it in the political media also of both sidesism that simultaneously dog whistles an approving wink over political media to mobilize re-territorializations in Charlottesville. We must look to de- and re-territorialize counter-hegemonic spaces supporting both localism and internationalism. I think that's our challenge here. Um, we're in a kind of archive fever 
um, and that's a, that, that's a Derridian term, whatever, um, between our disappearing social body structures and collapsing social relations and the struggles de to decorporatize our online platforms and control the agentive actions and surveillance of our proxy data bodies. Where we might look at this collapse through the Misena beam, um, and I'm talking about the screen and the screen in the screen, of social media as it devours our cultural and media institutions and monetizes, uh, monetizes our data body relations, Bifo Berardi proposes a refusal of debt um, and the logics of financialized capitalism that's gonna require some kind of alternative spaces, right? So instead we might increase our investment in poetic encounters to rebuild solidarity across the fragmented social body. Um, we will have to transform the anxiety and fragmentation of archive fever into action, um, but how to move forward. In order to assess this across um, the inevitable hybridity of our um, post-digital condition, I propose um, an emergent um, media hybridity that is media archeological, um, that understands what analog and digital media does and looks forward to what these genealogies might mutate and grow. Oh, sorry, I have to cover something else before my next slide. Um, the sociologist Sasky Assassin of um, the, the post-digital global city. Uh, she points out that multinational global capitalism has been delocalizing communities and resources that we depend upon to both survive and thrive. It has done so while simultaneously dissolving internationalism, fortifying massive deregulation dismantling nation states piecemeal for highly hypocritical elite and controlled flows of neoliberal economy and permitting the civil and human rights violations of people caught in the flow who migrate and then jam against its borders, especially when they don't present the ideally importable data bodies. I'm talking about income, I'm talking about passport, okay. Um, uh, in her essay, Deep Inside the Global City, um, Sassen calls for repeat and uh, inevitably temporary actions of anti-capital friction, which converge um, what she calls the hybrid bases of the city and use them to create divergent politics. This conception goes beyond Hakim Bey's notion of a temporary autonomous zone, also referred to as the TAS. Um, and there's like some hermetic uh, anarchist library online that has a lot of great readings if you want to check it out free um, so uh, Hakim Bey's Taz is described by some critics as lifestyle anarchism it attempts constant oh instead S Sasson's um, hybrid base friction of hybrid bases attempts constant and repetitive territorial and economically disruptive resistances by mixing in. Sasson even outlines a goal here, and I'm gonna quote her a little bit at length. It is the possibility of making her emphasis that matters here, and we should not squash it. The multiplication of bordered spaces, dividing those whose advantage grows from those who lose ground, is not good for a city. Mixing a city's differences is far more compelling, enabling, and also often more just if we think of a vast, diverse city that no actor can fully control. So um, I'm looking a little bit at this notion right now of um, spore, okay? Um, and you have this quote about what the swarm does. We, we often know what, what um, the um, the swarm does in social media. Um, you might uh, have heard it called outrage culture. In the early days of the internet, it was called flaming. I don't know if anyone remembers. <laughs> um, so Elizabeth Armstrong and Susanna Crage in their paper on the making of the Stonewall myth locate the longevity and portability of the commemorative, commemorative ritual of gay pride parades as a social memory vehicle in their amenability to institutionalization, okay? I would amend what she's writing and talk about counter institutions, but um, I don't think she comes from a discipline that has this language, okay? Um, and as Audre Lorde reminds us, um, we know these things, but it's really hard to materialize them unless we have the language for them. Um, so amongst this um, amenability, 
um, gay pride was repeatable. It had a triumphant cultural narrative of the Stonewall riots that um, was not universalable, was not universal, but included a shared memory of oppression that was mobilizing. Um, it was also flexible and compatible with activist media routines. It possessed the same power of symbolic expression that was targeted and dashed away, according to Jeffrey Juris, at the temporary new media centers of the art globalization movement's digital altern alternative press. And he says this is why he thinks that they were targeted by police. Um, but the success of gay pride parades may be that community activist infrastructures in cities across the nation were robust enough in resources, access, and skills to support and organize what Armstrong and Crage call the mnemonic capacity, like Johnny Mnemonic, the mnemonic capacity of these events into technologies of memory. Compared, compared to the data body infrastructures of anti-globalization, the infrastructures of what Armstrong and Crage call the primary social institutions of post-war gay culture were, were possibly also more uh, territorialized. Um, brick and mortar, gay bars. Um, determining a specific focus of conflict against police brutality um, in the flexible cultural vehicle of pride. So this cultural vehicle could travel across cities and activist organizations. It would catch on where they had social body strength, even though it was basically cultural data. Um, and um, they could still focus in on one issue. Even if Stonewall, um, as the originary riot, um, as the historians point out, is like completely and utterly a myth, okay? It's not the originary riot. Um, also, when recounting the described transportable resiliency of the Stonewall story, Armstrong and Crage note the following on the originary history of the riot that um, um, also, as an academic, ma a, a academic, it makes me cringe a little bit um, with fake news um, kind of warning bells to the fourth estate, um, and this is what they write. Discrepancies between popular and scholarly stories are common, as movements often find simple stories to be more useful than messier accounts. Common recognition, even if mythological, leads to the willingness of materialization. Um, so, um, sorry, that last sentence was mine. Um, I think if we really um, have to be, I'm, I'm giving you this, this notion of, of simplifying it, and, and we've seen this so much with the alt-right, you know, I mean, they just, they, they just want, they just want the mythological narrative. They don't, they do not care about journalism. They do not care about scholarship, okay. Um, and it's letting them organize remarkably well. Um, so I think we have to be really responsible about how we re- and deterritorialize that as a tactic, okay. So we move from the narrative of the rhizomatic cell that can be killed off easily um, and let the movement supposedly survive to that of the spore that can seed in the contextual and locational time spaces um, that fit trajectories, transport the, sphere, the spherical consciousness inside of historical genealogies. And I'm, I'm talking about the, the agency of, of one thing, knowing where it wants to go and knowing where it wants to seed. So um, unfortunately, we've seen examples of this, um, this kind of phenomenon. They actually uh, starve spaces of a politics of difference, and they create hyper-realities um, within the portable corporate festival. Um, what I'm going to say might be controversial, but I did a whole little ethnography on this on the Canadian Association of Fringe Festivals um, at one point. Um, and uh, where they were headquartered in um, Mervish Village. Um, I did a mobile app. You can go look at it. Um, you can see the neighborhood re-territorialized, uh, the Mervish Village neighborhood um, that they use at their home base before it was um, torn down. Um, and um, some of that um, condominium change um, was done um, with kind of a smooth veneer of promising micro retail spaces. Okay, they're always they're always counter appropriating the tactics. Um, but as you can see, this Canadian Association of Fringe Festival model 
um, is a modularity that it's, is spreading um, and um, the Montreal Infringement Festival um, has been dealing with a lot of legal troubles. One of the things that CAF has done is they've copyrighted the use of the word fringe. I'm not joking. I don't know if you know this. And the Infringement Festival has now turned to UNESCO to categorize fringe as intangible cultural heritage, which um, is meant to protect you know, Native American communities, um, it's re indigenous communities. Um, around the world, it's pretty, um, it's pretty wild. Um, so uh, I wanted to show you this and um, and have us think about good modularity and bad modularity. Okay. Um, I will say that um, I don't know if you if you if you've heard of Nine Inch Nails did something interesting with reterritorializing the ticketing of their latest tour. Um, but um, you might want to look into that because I found that really interesting. They're actually kind of like mobilizing this like global like anarchist fandom and telling them that they can't get tickets. Um, they're, they're trying to um, d discourage elite ticket purchasing and StubHub ripoffs and all these kind of capitalizations. Um, and and they're, they did they did sales for all the concerts that required people to physically come into the cities and buy them. Um, what this does is it um, privileges a, a local fan network, first and foremost. And then um, in terms of um, uh, economic hybridity, we're getting back to avant pop. You know, the money needs to come from somewhere. Um, the, the middle class who could afford to just travel to a city twice for one concert, the first time to buy the tickets, um, they're going to be at least um, territorializing repeat economic um, action um, in those communities around where those concerts are being held um, and you know localizing knowledge through repeat visits and things like that so check it out um, there are a couple things I've kind of glossed over um, that maybe as a scholar is citationally irresponsible um, how I've, uh, uh, I've appropriated Foucault's use of genealogy, but I've kind of changed it based on the theory of um, uh, Laclau and Mouf um, to um, emphasize making um, uh, locational and micropolitical actions. Um, I'm also using the notion of the micropolitical and the locational based on a scholar um, named Raunig, and um, what he really talks about is the failure of um, the failed revolutionary strategy of the all or nothing takeover. And what the all or nothing takeover does a lot of times is it takes over the existing social structures, social relations, and modes of production. Why do we want those? How, how do you change them if you're taking them over wholesale? So um, this gets into the locational and, and the micropolitical. Um, and in interest of that, I'm just gonna tell you, um, I'm gonna read one more paragraph and then I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the network I um, am studying. Um, so again, a, a more global perspective. Um, one spore and, and where it's going to go, um, the locational and the micropolitical, um, the spherical consciousness that um, is in that spore before it even decides where to go, what to do, uh, what its tactics are. Um, so as John Rahagi points out in his New Tools, Old Goals, um, he does a comparison of the Iranian social movements from 1979 and um, 2009. And uh, he points out that uh, the creation of friction in the post-digital world brings its own challenges, including the over oversimplification of the impact of digital communication technology and its failure to fill distinct if overlapping roles in necessary elements of social movements. Um, or let, let's, let's even say, Micropolitical change needs this too. Um, 
these necessary elements are organization, recruiting, motivating, and informing. So Rahagi specifically points to the use of audio cassette technology during the Iranian Revolution because it was both accessible and not easy to trace, okay? Um, a, a lot of people at this point in time had audio cassette players, but it was not easy to trace. Um, but this also means that micropolitical locational community movements to create friction may be able to take advantage of boutique and retro analog technology, okay? Um, it depends how mass you want your movement to be. If you believe, um, I shouldn't even say the word believe, if your intellectual, cultural, and epistemolo epistemological genealogy supports um, micropolitical and locational activism as opposed to mass revolution, um, then why can't you use boutique and, and less accessible analog technology? Why not? Um, on the other hand, um, it also points to the need to add an extra step of new media literacy education to activist work with accessible digital technology that can counter surveillance or targeted internet slowdowns, et cetera, okay? Um, because um, you're not just passing someone a cassette tape when you're passing them digital information. You're passing them something that is easily surveillable, right, if you haven't made that a step in your activist process. So um, we have a couple options here. Um, because we're in like, we, we started like 15, 20 minutes late, but like now we're in workshop time. So um, what I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna put this away. Um, and I, I have a few slides where I can talk a little bit more. Sorry, this is really tight. Um, I can talk a little bit more off the cuff about um, my research, my media archaeological and, and media history research um, of these, um, these cultural movements um, in the New York network that I said is this chain that moves up from New York City to the Canadian border. Um, I, can, I can talk to you about some of those places a little bit more off the cuff. Um, I can take questions. Um, my original um, idea um, before I got a little bit disorganized and like had water spill on some of my notes and have some of my <laughs> like, links broken in my transfer of the presentation. As you can see, like I'm probably not as good digitally as, all, as many of you. <laughs> um, but uh, um, uh, I also had the idea of breaking people into groups to actually just workshop on, on strategies to do this and, and put it in a Google document. Um, so um, I guess what I'll do um, is I'll see if, if people have um, some questions, if they feel motivated. Um, uh, to, to get into groups, kind of feel this out for maybe like five, ten minutes, and then we'll go from there. And um, as, as you can tell, I can talk, right? So like, I got all this shit, right? And, oop, except I just blew it up. Um, but we can keep going. I lost a little bit of this, but um, how about like five minute break and then we'll see if people have like questions or something? Wants to, yeah, I'm getting another thumbs up. Okay. Yeah, if you, it, you, you know, we can, we, we can just, if you need to get up and take a break and come back, don't feel rude. Hi, Jennifer and Jessica. Um, can you guys hear me? I don't know. Um, I was wondering, uh, so maybe this is a little bit of inside baseball because um, uh, I too have a degree from uh, University of Buffalo, Buffalo Media Study. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and one of the things that you touched on, which I was wondering if you could talk about more, is um, one of the significant things about 
uh, UB and media study is not only was it one of the early programs in artist film and video, is that there's this long-standing history of activism. And so uh, media study in Buffalo was involved in, uh, for example, like getting footlockers of medical equipment to the east side during the race riots. Mm -hmm. um, there was, uh, when students were protesting the war in Vietnam, there was a faculty walkout in support of the students and uh, it ended up with faculty members being like blackballed and it was, this is like 1970. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, maybe some of the stuff that was done at the Experimental Film Center or even Squeaky Wheel, um, which mm -hmm. Tony Conrad helped fo uh, found mm -hmm. around using media to actually um, help people in the community. So the mm -hmm. example I'm thinking of is, um, and you probably know this, is one of the things that Tony Conrad did in addition to being this experimental filmmaker was he, uh, they had a public access television. Uh, the AMM Collective. Yes, the uh -huh. AMM Collective. And they, they had this like public access show. And one of the things he would do was actually uh, go on television after school and kids who were doing their homework could call in and he would help them with their math over television. And so I was wondering whether you had any other examples uh, like that you could share with us of people using, uh, of people within this institution or in institutions using media to actually try to uh, engage communities where they are mm -hmm. as opposed to where they, th they think they should be. Okay. Um, I can answer that by jumping around, I think, to one or two slides I have, and I'll talk about that briefly, and then I'll take another question. Okay. So, um, uh, Tony Conrad, um, because, because what I research comes from a viewpoint of counter-institutionality, um, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna converge and diverge with what, the, with the wonderful, um, uh, examples that you've brought up, but, um, Tony Conrad, um, uh, or Tony Conrad, um, a couple things. Um, the squeaky wheel um, was founded um, when NISCA created a, a very specific media arts funding program. And um, I found something in the archives where the uh, creation of squeaky wheel, its mission statement and everything was actually opened up to the whole media arts community. Um, and it was opened up to, um, the university and all these different counter-institutional organizations like Hull Walls. Um, and so that was, it's not surprising what Squeaky Wheel did because Squeaky Wheel was, um, was formed by the activist community, okay? Um, that's not always clearly exactly the case, like when Hall Walls was formed. Hall Walls was more kind of like a, 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 an artist group that the Albright Knox Museum helped to get nonprofit status and public money um, because the Albright Knox was having problems with other avant-garde worker-oriented artist organizations that were complaining that the Albright Knox was preferring New York City artists to local artists. Uh, that's actually like one of the backstories of Hall Walls. Um, the slide I have up is Art Park. Now Art Park is an artist residency program. Um, I, I I'm the project archivist on his archive, and um, this artist residency program that uh, started in 74, um, Tony Conrad was really um, involved in the, dis the, the dismantling of the, the, the funding for this. So um, when Art Park uh, was founded, um, it actually was, it seems like what happened was the state overbuilt this theater and then they decided to kind of create this ha this happening type of festival around it. Then they got public money um, for an artist residency program, and all the emer emergent media was there: land art, body art, uh, video art, um, signal processing art. Um, faculty from uh, UB Media Studies were coming there, um, and it kind of worked like a counter institution within an institu within a state institution. This is a state park. Um, and uh, the way it was dismantled was actually the inner envelope of the, of the, um, the, the counter institution was dismantled. The artist residency program, they started trying to control curation. Um, Tony, uh, I'm, 
Tony Conrad was involved in a major protest over this in, I believe it was 1990, um, when um, survival research laboratories, um, they're, they're, uh, pr they're, they, they build machines that destroy things, and um, Bibles were going to be involved, and they had an open call to people to donate Bibles. Um, and they were they were going to use like images of gay pornography and stuff, and and people lost their minds, and and um, it was uh, it was um, controlled, um, and so um, uh, he w he was involved in that. Um, it, it's one of these way one of these kind of counter institutional pockets is under recognized, and I'm actually kind of like doing a recovery history of this residency program because um, people haven't realized how important it was to the media arts network, um, including the kitchen, including cable Soho, um, including um, uh, people from the artist television network in New York City. Um, uh, I mean, it, it goes it goes on and on. Chris Burton in, involved in you know, like Cal State TV. Um, uh, but um, Th this is the, this is a little bit what I'm talking about about um, spheres and just like avant pop sometimes turns to, to mass culture sometimes we need to, to find ways to create counter institutional pockets within institutions with resources and political protection. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Oh, this is the other. I'm sorry. This is the other thing I wanted to talk about. Paul Sheritz, who is a really famous structural filmmaker. Who, um, who was at UB, he was brought in UB when the program was formed. Uh, again, we're talking about the first media arts program in a university ever, according to, um, uh, according to um, the, the, um, se the, the secondary research I've looked at. And he came up with a model of cinematics um, that basically established the Media Arts Center as a counter institution with the university that teaches a canon, but also is flexible in modularity to, to students being able to develop their own epistemological interests and abilities. Um, he said that this was really important. It needed um, to, to be able to connect to liberal arts programs. This is why he left Antioch University. And really, it's like um, he's t looking at horizon He's looking at structures of community media arts horizontalism, but he's looking at it as a program in a university. And so you may think, like, well, who cares? Like, I don't, I'm not going to be a university professor, but I'm telling you, you should read this. Um, and film culture was its own um, alternative, part of the alternative space movement because it was a um, artist-led, peer-curated um, artist magazine that was created by Jonas Magus. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, Paul Sheritz was a visionary. And, um, and, he, and he, if you read this, it's, it really is a model for grassroots uh, organizing, if you ask me, across counter institutions and institutions. Um, so yeah, sorry. Any other questions? Can I ask one? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm sorry, I've been a bit in and out, so I might have missed you covering this, but I'm really interested in how people who maybe um, aren't coming from a, the same background or the same discipline, sort of like, like what do you see as a path for people to find out about this stuff or like the role archiving and um, an archive plays in this and like what forms of archive archives maybe are needed yeah. to sort of draw new people in? Um, I think um, anyone interested in this um, should look at what's been coming out um, on, uh, on community archives. Um, I've read stuff on people um, hacking Instagram to do community archives on like the Chicana movement in California. Um, uh, I think, um, as Ed Sanders said, you use the tack you have. Um, but I think um, what people need to really seek is, um, uh, you know, we, we use the word theory, but theory is just a way of describing um, the state of things and the practice of things. Um, and so um, 
I, I suppose um, looking at praxis, um, but, d but definitely there's a lot of new research coming out on um, community archiving. Um, and I think that that um, is something where you lo wanna look at, and you wanna, and you wanna look at this balance between um, archival resilience, but also um, questions of vulnerability, surveillance, visibility, um, especially when you're dealing with digital archives and you're dealing with activism, right? Um, we don't all get to have a performative matrix to, uh, of institutions, you know, that we can duck behind. Anyone else? No? So maybe, um, why don't we do a, a little five uh, minute break and then yeah. we have time to have a more close conversation so people who kind of want to have a more discussion uh, session, maybe we could sure. move to the front. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you.